Yeah, Andrew, that was really good how you had uh, just the, the, per, the presenter's face really small in the corner and the slide being full screen. Each session got better that way. I don't actually think I can really control that. I think Carla did that. Because mm. I didn't do anything different. I think it's up to the user. But fortunately, it only it only records the speaker and um, the slides. So no matter what people have on right. their um, on their display. I don't hear music. No, I don't either. I click the button. That's OK. Welcome, everyone. We'll be getting started in about four minutes. Thirty seven. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Delete that game, bro. Far, no one's emailing about having trouble getting in. Linda, I'll take questions at the end as long as they want to go. Okay. Because I don't want to. I don't want to take them till the end. So I'm going to try to keep my slides at 45 minutes and then start taking questions.
it seems the music stopped again. Yes, it did. Oh, Andrew's doing something. All right, it's seven o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the final presentation of the Houston chapter of the Native Plant Society's Wildscapes Workshop 2021. Just to recap, uh, we've heard from uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy, uh, Glenn Olson, Carla Clay on Tuesday, and tonight we'll have Mark Morgenstern talk about native plants of Southeast Texas. As a reminder, our sale, our online sale will start on October 9th, uh, this Saturday, uh, for Wildscapes ticket holders, and uh, we'll open to the general public uh, this Sunday, October 10th. I am putting the last, tying the last bow on the sale website and uh, hope to finish it while I am listening to Mark's presentation tonight. And I hope to send that link out in the chat here. Just, uh, I know some people have been having some difficulty with the emails. So I wanted to make sure to send that uh, that shop link out tonight, and we'll mention that as well before we go, uh, so that you can copy <laughs> that link and check out the website uh, prior to the sale. Our pickup will be uh, the following Saturday, October 16th, at the City of Houston Permitting Center. You can get the address and more details at our website, npsot.org slash Houston. Uh, we are still looking for volunteers to help with the sale. Uh, it's going to be a drive-through uh, pickup, so we'll need volunteers uh, to help set up the orders. The uh, pickup will take place from 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. We're looking for volunteers to come join us uh, starting at 8 a.m. to organize the orders uh, so that people's plants are all grouped together for when they arrive. We have a sign up, a volunteer sign up on Sign Up Genius. Uh, the link was sent out in the Eventbrite email uh, to sign up for volunteering. And it's also on our website's Wildscapes page, again, npsot.org slash Houston, and click the Wildscapes uh, icon. And on October 10th, we, are, uh, we have organized tours to, as part of the statewide symposium. Uh, fall symposium. So on Saturday or Sunday, sorry, sun, this Sunday, October 10th uh, at 8 a.m., our board member Susie Shapiro will host a tour of her all native landscaped home in Montrose from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., uh, Mary Carol Edwards will be uh, hosting a tour of her uh, Green Star wetland plant farm in Alvin. Uh, and starting at 10 a.m., the Clearly, Clear Lake chapter of the Native Plant Society will uh, be hosting tours of Bay Area habitats. See the addresses in uh, today's Eventbrite email. I want to extend uh, our thanks again to all of you attendees, uh, our sponsors, and our donors. Uh, again, it's our only uh, fundraiser each year. And the proceeds go toward our monthly meetings, our Native Landscape Certification Program uh, courses, this workshop, uh, the Native Plant Society Symposium, uh, scholarships, and our new Wildscapes Grant Program. Uh, again, we want to have a slide to uh, specifically thank our sponsors. You can see here, and uh, we have many, many of you who stepped up as leaf litter sponsors 100, the $1 to $100 uh, sponsorship level as well. So thank you so much to all of you. Uh, you can also see these on our website. We uh, just announced our first Wildscapes grant recipient, uh, Pin Oak Elementary, I think it's Pin Oak Middle School, maybe it's elementary, uh, for a native plant garden. The Longhorn Project at Johnson Space Center to create an educational prairie installation. 
uh, the Hearthstone Garden Club for a Nine Natives plant walk at Bob Allen Park, and the Westchester Academy for International Studies uh, for a wildcat prairie study where they're teaching their students about uh, prairie succession. We also want to thank again uh, our chapter board and our wildscapes committee. Uh, all of you have worked very hard to make this happen this year. Uh, we have about half of previous year's board and committee members. Uh, so please uh, look for our monthly newsletters. Our previous ones and our future ones all have information about uh, attending our board meetings. We have the, the Zoom link posted is the same link for each month's meeting, which takes place uh, on the fourth Tuesday of every month at 6.30. Our Wildscapes Committee meets the first Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Again, those links uh, and schedules are in our newsletters. Um, so thank you uh, to everyone who's been helping out this year. And tonight's speaker is Mark Morgenstern. Uh, he's a longtime member of our chapter. Uh, he told us that he attended the first ever Wildscapes workshop here in Houston in the 90s, and he is the founder and owner of Morningstar Prairie Plants. Uh, he's a, a propagates a lot of plants for us for our plant sale and uh, also brings them to the uh, farmer's market. What's the name of that farmer's market? Every Saturday? Oh, you're muted, Mark. Urban, Urban Harvest. Harvest. Farmers, Urban Harvest Farmer's Market every Saturday year-round, 8 to noon. Urban Harvest. At the St. John's yeah. School. At St. John's School. 2752 and, Buffalo Speedway. And he's also a member of uh, the Coastal Prairie Chapter of the Texas Master Naturalists and of the Houston Chapter of the Native Prairies Association. So without further ado, I turn the floor over to Mark. Thank you so much, Mark, for talking to us tonight about our native plants. Thank you. Okay, is it full screen up there? Not yet. It's it's there. There it goes. Okay. So, anyways, uh, I started this business, my Morning Star Prairie Plant business, in 2014 after Jaime Gonzalez offered me four dollars for every love grass I could come up with, and the purple love grass, and so I I gave them to him. I never charged him, but then I worked closely with Katie MD on how to set up a business. And she showed me the, how to set up a DBA. I'm an LLC now, but anyways, uh, uh, it grew from there and it's just, it's a lot of fun. So I'm doing, the job I'm doing now is what I always enjoyed doing before. And so I was able to quit work full time and do this full time. So let's see what we got here. Okay, this is why we grow native plants. See that a lot of people call this upside down plant communities because two thirds, when you see a big blue stem, that's a big grass, two thirds of the plant material is underground. And, uh, you know, here's some examples. You can see the lawn that can hold about two, uh, two inches an hour of rain where this prairie will take in 80, will take in eight inches of rain before you even get runoff in an hour, which is just incredible. So uh, that's why we do it. Deep roots, totally drought tolerant. Nash Prairie, they never uh, hate it. They never um, plowed it or disturbed it. They always rolled hay there. Any prairies that survived today were hay because they'd all be trees, you know? And uh, with the end bit, a barbed wire fence brought in birds perching there and dropping seeds and trees. So anyways, uh, they never, um, they always could depend on that in a drought. And I was out there one time after a burn of uh, six weeks, and there were cracks in the ground. 
and the whole prairie was just in full bloom. Beautiful colors with the gulf muley and, and all that. And, uh, and it looked like a moonscape we were walking on because you could see some ash left over from the fire and these huge cracks. It hadn't rained a drop since the burn, but it didn't care. It didn't matter because of the depth of these roots. So why do we grow native plants? Well, they're adapted to this area. They survive, um, you know, heat tolerant, drought tolerant, freeze tolerant, flood tolerant. And uh, I planted a garden at that, we're talking about urban harvest. There was a little curb planting. It didn't have anything. This little curb, it had one uh, Mexican buckeye bush, which is actually a native Texas plant. And then the whole curb was nothing but mulch. So I started planting it. And, you know, I didn't ask permission or nothing. I just said, at the end of the day, I'd take an extra plant, stick it in there. Well, then the freeze came. I had 15 degrees at my house. They had 12 degrees. That whole thing is blooming now. And when I would show people, I always point it out. You know, it's right next to my booth. I always point this thing out. And they said, what did you cover it with? And I said, cover it? I don't even live in uh, Harris County. You know, I live uh, 45 to an hour drive away. And they just couldn't believe it, which is a great selling point. So, you know, they won't die in a freeze. They're less effort. Uh, they probably habitat, uh, prevent erosion with the deep roots, and then plant diversity. And you want to get, you know, a properly functioning pocket prairie. Uh, you want to get a good diversity of plants in there. And a lot of people don't want to plant grasses. And the issue with that is, a lot of grasses are host plants. People don't realize that. But if you go to wildflower.org and you type in the plant, it'll show you if it's a house plant and um, a host plant. And if you can, there's a new feature, you click on that host plant and it'll show the butterflies. And then you can uh, see with the map that pops up if they're in your area. So the first one we're going to talk about is aquatic milkweed, Asclepius perennis. This is a great plant, heavy clay soil, shade tolerant. Um, I do have some of these in full sun at a garden I, I volunteer at in Fort Bend County, Seaborn Creek Nature Park. And the beds are irrigated, so it does just fine. But these seeds I actually collect on my property. I found these plants many, many years ago. and uh, I have little bags, I got pods uh, bagged up right now uh, of, uh, I got four bags out in the field right now. And when the, the pod cracks on the side, you get 50 or so seeds, sometimes more. And the, this milkweed has no silk, it's never airborne. When there's a heavy rain event, uh, the seeds are like little boats and they float to a new location. So I've saw, I saw some out in the woods, uh, I got an acre of woods here where I collect most of these at. And um, I see that uh, a lot of those are, um, I got some new areas. And I have actually pounded in a wood stake with fluorescent uh, orange paint on top to find the plants so I can keep collecting the seeds. So the ones I'm bringing there are uh, all grown from seed that's locally collected, which most of my plants are. I, I buy about 5% of my seeds, which is not much, but 95% all locally collected. And so this is slim milkweed, Asclepius linearis. These are um, uh, spindly leaves, but they see how that colony forms right there around it? You can see all that. Well, if you plant these in a happy spot, these will take full sun and clay. I also just read today where they're salt tolerant, so they're, they can be down by the coast even. But um, they will form a colony. There's a colony on my street. Sometimes they line up like single file, like soldiers. And me and Dre took a walk last year, right down the street from my house was a whole row of these in uh, somebody's, well, the city property, but they always mow it. So it's not gonna bloom and make seed. But I've dug some of them. They transplant pretty easily too. So that's a great plant. Now I don't have the uh, viridis, Asclepius viridis, the green milkweed on this slides because I didn't know we were going to get any until the last minute because uh, 
uh, Audubon had an open house and they thought they would sell out, but they didn't. So we will have some uh, Viridis for sale. But Viridis is a plant that, that totally disappears in the, um, in the winter time. It also has a taproot on Viridis that's about the size of a, a soda can. And picture that tapering down for nine feet. So mine, I go out here and uh, I had one that was kind of ate by a monarch caterpillar. And uh, I just, it, look, it was looking rough. I mowed it, it came right back up and bloomed. It's right next to the house actually. So I mowed it on purpose and it came up, it's blooming out there right now. And every time I mow an area, these will, and it rains, these will pop up and bloom. Uh, but Viridis is a fader, it's a perennial. But one of the other things we're offering at the sale is some biotone mycorrhizae fertilizers. Me and Dre have been bagging up these little $2 bags. And uh, people found out at Armin Bayou that the Viridis was acting like an annual. Well, there wasn't enough mycorrhizae uh, fungus in the soil to support it. So they started inoculating the, the holes before they plant it and GPS them and they're coming back. So you it'd be smart if you're buying any of the milkweed to buy a bag of that. Grass is not necessarily so much mycorrhizae dependent um, as, uh, uh, for, as uh, milkweeds, but I use it on everything, even vegetables. So let's look at the next one. This is the Indian blanket, Glardia puchella. Um, these, I bet the seeds are, they're seeding like crazy right now. What I do is I snip the seed heads off the plants um, and I just drop them into the pot. And there's all, so some of these, if you buy these, you can see a lot of pups in the, in the base of the plant. So this is, uh, um, you know, it reseeds readily. It acts like a perennial because it, it drops so many seed. A uh, friend of mine is going to bring me, there's a maroon variety. A friend of mine is going to get me some seed. I didn't grow that this year, but I will uh, next year. And so that's a great plant and butterflies galore on that. And uh, blue mist flower. This is our local blue mist flower. Um, these are blooming like crazy right now. If you cut out, if you got some that, have some dried seed heads. If you cut them off, they'll bloom some more. Uh, these are easy to grow, not particular about soil at all. Um, and so they're, they're a great plant. And the, 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 uh, there's other mist flowers from the hill country, but this is our local one that occurs here. I see it on the prairies. I see it on roadsides here. Uh, driving around today, I saw some out in the fields. So a uh, great plant, easy to grow. And blue pitcher sage, this is one of the, the most gorgeous plants. This is four foot tall. Um, that picture I believe is probably in Ash Prairie. I got these in my front yard and out in, uh, a lot of them. And uh, I can't grow these fast enough. I mean, land talked me into saving three. That's all I had left of these and I grew hundreds of them. I mean, the thing is, is it, it's also shade tolerant. You know, it's always out on Nash, it's always around the huge clumps of switchgrass. You go on the um, south side of that switchgrass and then you see huge colonies of this. And uh, last year around this time, uh, when I went out there, they were covered with monarchs and they, you know, they're not laying eggs anymore. They're nectaring, they don't need milkweed heading to Mexico. So basically they're all nectar plants and they were all over this one. And um, yeah, I just couldn't keep them in stock. It's just incredible. A, a, a landscaper bought one where the person had full shade between a narrow strip between two houses. And she got so excited that when it bloomed, she sent her a picture and then the landscaper sent me a picture. It's my friend, Philippa Johnstone. And so full shade, I couldn't believe it. but. Uh, so that's a great plant. It gets pretty tall, but it's pretty much stays erect. You know, some plants, if you plant them in a raised bed, they might want to tie the topple over. That's why it's always good to have some bamboo sticks to support them. A black-eyed Susan, uh, 
these are easy to grow. Land taught me a neat trick where you put the, uh, this was at one of those seed packing parties with Jaime Gonzalez, and you put them in a, in a jar, the heads, because the seeds don't separate real easy, and you just shake the heck out of it, and then you got a whole thing of seeds there. So uh, that worked, that worked great. So anyways, uh, I sold out of these too, but Audubon had them. So there's Rebecca Herta, Rebecca uh, Texana is our local coneflower, they're related. A camphor daisy. This is uh, Wally Ward's contribution or our, our, uh, our wildscape because it's Ray Jacksonia. Uh, one to two foot, not particular about soil at all. I got some out here in the clay and they're blooming like crazy. And uh, he gave me the seeds. I actually planted some on my property so I could collect my own seeds. So that's what I like to do. Let's see what the next one is. Frog fruit. This is blown up. Those are really tiny. This is a nectar for several butterflies, like six, a host plant. So, uh, and I see them on there too. But uh, this can get, if it's in rich soil, moist, it can get out of control. You might have to go out there with scissors and cut it back, but it's great. It's better to have ground cover than have uh, weeds come in, you know? So ground covers are great. And I got these, I never grow them in gallons because you don't need to. They're all in four inch pots at the sale. So you can get them, uh, you know, put relatively cheap and two or three will cover them cover a big area, you know, because they spread like crazy. And uh, they're happy, they take a little shade too. Elephant's foot. So this is a uh, tormentosa, um, little pink flowers. I got these in four inch pots and one gallons. Uh, they're big in the four inch pots and they're blooming. And you know, these are drought tolerant. I saw them in a, in a state park in East Texas on a trail and they were all over the place in this woods. So that's the first time I saw them in the wild was like last year. Gulf Coast Penstemon. These are gorgeous. Um, they, they pop up in my wife's vegetable garden every year. This, they reseed like crazy. So I dig them and pot them and uh, get them out of there so she has room for her veggies. Uh, beautiful color and it's a deep deep color uh i i saw these in a while when i first bought my pro, my house i was walking a fence line this back in 2001 and i found some wild pensten pens, pens and they were really small you know and uh they were only about six inches tall and they were blooming but when they're in the rich soil or my pots i got some that are blooming this fall for some reason a couple of them popped up in bloom. But if these come up in the spring, and once the seeds start to form, you could cut it off and get a second bloom. And uh, that's a long bloom time too, March through June. So the next plant, this is a last leaf blanket flower. This is Gallardia astavilis. This is a different Gallardia. You see how the ray flowers don't go all the way around? This is from Deer Park Prairie. Um, we don't have these this year. I hope to have them in the sale next year. Uh, Susan Connedy, my friend, has them in her backyard. She said they come back every year. They're not particular about soil or anything. So that's that's one we can look forward to. And a lot of people like it better than the, the, the eating blanket. So uh, Landsleeve Coreopsis. These grow just as wide as they do tall. So they, they grow, they'll make a bush about two feet wide and two feet tall. Now it take, they don't bloom a whole lot to the second year. I had a few uh, where I dropped some seeds out here and they actually bloomed and uh, some in Andrea's butterfly garden, but it takes two years. So you buy these, plant them now, and then next year you'll have, uh, you'll have lots of blooms on that. Yeah, it doesn't care about soil either. So let's see what the next one is. Mexican hat. I have these grown wild on my prairie here. Um, so I go out with scissors. They're not really dense. I've seen these people plant these where they'll fill in a whole area. 
uh, one of my customers at the market showed me a picture of her property she owns west of here and they they were just solid mexican hat um beautiful there's different color variations in that on those uh petals there so you can have some that are all yellow some that are maroon like this and so they have uh variations in them uh, that's another one that's easy to grow let's see what we got next Missouri ironweed has got to be one of my favorites and a lot of my customers' favorites too. Um, I got people up, up north, uh, down south of here, uh, growing these. I found these on my property uh, when I bought it in 2001. They were all over the place. And I knew very, I had some native plants in my front yard when I moved here from Houston, but I had very little experience with these. And the way I learned was, you know, I cut, I would cut these plants off, put them in a vase, take them to a native plant society meeting. And then people will say, wow, nice ironweed. And that's how I found out the name of it. Same with some other plants. I took them to, in a vase. I couldn't ID them. If I use books, I don't, it's not that, uh, iNaturalist is pretty good now. I, I'm pretty good with that on uh Android, they have a compare feature. People don't seem to have it on their iPhones, but the compare feature is really cool because you take a picture, then the next box says, what did you see? Click that, and then you say compare. And they might, you have one of your pictures up there, and they might have six, sometimes even more of their pictures. And you just scroll by and you get a positive ID. Uh, it's really good. A friend of mine on iPhone was out there with me the other day and she couldn't get it the compare feature to work but i mean i can i can do a plant in less than 30 seconds um if i got a good signal on my phone that is less than 30 seconds i can come up with the uh with the identification and this guy you'll see you'll see all kinds of skippers bees native bees um butterflies of all sizes i had a um there's that Brazilian vervain. Um, I saw a golf fritter. Brazilian vervain, butterflies love it. I, you know, it's not, it's not ever gonna like totally invade a prairie. It should be taken out. But um, anyways, I saw a golf fritillary on a Brazilian vervain. And I took a clump, I picked a clump, a small clump of this with my hand, and I walked over there and held it out, and it jumped off the vervain and onto the ironwood ironweed that was in my hand. Now, these uh, varieties change. I saw some up in the panhandle once they were growing out of cracks and rocks. Uh, there's a New York ironweed that's on Long Island. Um, so the, the varieties of this, if you go west uh, and north, you'll see the varieties change. And so the species around here is this Missouri ironweed. Beautiful color too. Holds that color a long time. And also, if you want to collect seed, it has to be, some people are picking it early. The top of that has to be look really cottony when they fill, fill out for the seeds. And they, they uh, germinate pretty easy. So they really have to wait. You'll see the little capsule of the flowers close and they'll see a little brown, but wait till they poof out and look like cotton and then it's ready to pick. So mountain mint, Pycnanthemum teniofolium. Uh, Jane Ryerson, I hope she's on here tonight, but uh, she's in Native Plant Society for many, many years. And she came over to my house, this had to be at least 15 years ago. And this was blooming, it had to be around this time of year. She got out of the car and she goes, wow, nice mountain mint. I go, wow, I, you know, me and a friend tried to ID it and we couldn't, you know, little white flowers. And um, so basically I said, what species? She said, I don't know. So I, I researched mountain mints. Uh, it, it, a native plant that's native to Harris, Fort Bend County with the word mountain in it. It's kind of strange, right? Well, a guy hiking in the mountains of Pennsylvania in the 1600s looking for useful plants named the genus and it stuck. There was 20 species. Uh, this is a local one here. Um, 
One in the Carolinas that I think is extinct, so there's actually 19. But this one grows in heavy clay soil. Um, it's also, when the Europeans moved in this area in the 18, early 1800s, 1820s, 1830s, they rubbed the leaves of this plant on their arms for mosquito repellent. So that's what they did. And you can also make tea out of it. Now in clay, it's pretty well behaved, but a customer of mine put it in her raised bed vegetable garden. She said it went berserk. And it, grew, it grew through the chain link fence into the neighbor's yard. And she said, the neighbor knows what it is, goes out there with a bowl and a pair of scissors and cuts a batch to make some tea. So that's really neat. It took me a long time to figure out what this is. And the fact that uh, the ones we have at the sale are from seed that I found on this property. These could be, these plants in this neighborhood here are thousands of years old. Um, you know, they, they go way, way back. I got a, a neighbor down the street has a, keeps this lawn pretty well cropped and I can see remnants of Mima mounds in their yard. And um, yeah, you can see the humps all over their yard. And I told them that, I don't know if they believe me, but they did some testing where they drilled the Mima mounds and tested the sand and dated the sand in the mounds. And they're like 5,000 years old. And there's a lot of theories on how Mima mounds form, uh, Pipple mounds on prairies. One is pocket gophers. The guy ran a computer simulation about 800 years of pocket gophers stashing stuff away would get you a mound. Another one was buffalo wallows in the wind, you know, uh, buffalo wallowing in the, and there were bison here um, in Damon. Damon, Texas, where I live, there's uh, three kill sites at the base. Damon's mound is a salt dome. There's basically three uh, bison kill sites at the base of that mound. And these weren't horseback. This was way before that. They used a uh, spear throwing atlatl and, uh, and, and would, would chase them to the mound while the other ones were right in there at the base with the spears. And they speared them bison and, and slaughtered them right there. And they were far south as Lake Jackson. There's not huge uh, colonies like or huge herds like there is in the Midwest, but nonetheless, they were here. Uh, sweet scent, Pluchia odorota. This is a neat plant. I, I was given seeds at the seed swap years ago, and they said, you ought to grow this. Uh, I'll tell you where I found it. I saw this on the dune side of in Matagorda close to, you know, 100 yards from the beach. I saw it in a lake in Sugarland. Uh, there's a lot of wetlands in Sugarland, Texas. And a person sent me pictures of, of a couple sites in Sugarland. And then at the Master Naturalist Conference, we're at a park in, um, uh, in the hill country. And we're on a hike. And I saw it in the pond in, uh, in the city of Georgetown. In this big pond, I saw it at the edge of the water and I picked a leaf to make sure because it's super fragrant. Some people say it stinks, odorota, but that means fragrant, you know, in a super fragrant leaves. And the cool thing is when you, um, when you, uh, when you crush that leaf is the smell. When I'm separating little seedlings, I'm going to grow, I'm going to plant some of this down in January, I got some heat mats in my garage. When you're separating seedlings with a pencil, you can actually smell the uh, scent from the little tiny three inch tall plants. So love that plant. And this is another one. These flowers aren't even that opened um, yet on this picture. But when they open up, you get three colors, you know, dark lavender, dark purple, pink, and white, all mixed in a giant head. Uh, in the pot, they kind of erect. Once they get in the ground, they turn it into a bush. So uh, yeah, this is a, a great plant. Ne great nectar source too. Rosin weed sunflower. Um, this is our uh, Sophium gracile, which is basically slim rosin weed, they call it. I actually should have that name in there. Uh, somebody corrected me on my wife 
uh, that rosin weed and slim rosin weed are two different things, but I don't pay much attention to common names. Sophium brucil, that's our local one. This is uh, the first time I grew this. There's a little two acre prairie in Alvin next to the fire department is still there. When he gets close to the ditch, he leaves about six foot because you don't want to get that hay machine close to that ditch. So it's about six foot. And the first time I walked up to one of these flowers and the seeds form right behind the petals. And I reached my hand and, you know, I want to see what it was. And the seeds fell into my hand. And uh, I was growing it before I knew what it was. And uh, Wally Ward really helped me out with this one because I always got low germination. I might have a cell of 50 and I get six plants. And Wally told me, you know, I just learned this. Always keep your, you know, stay humble. Always be willing to learn. And so I, uh, he told me, put that just in the Ziploc bag I had them stored in. Uh, put it in the fridge. Just dry, not vermiculite or wet like you do a milkweed. But anyways, just dry. And the germination was incredible. You know, the whole cell came up. So, um, yeah, I got, me and Andre have been collecting out here. We got buckets of this, of this stuff. And it's great because it's it was here when I bought this place. And and uh, and they're all blooming right now. The Swamp Sunflower, Maximilian, and Rosinweed are all blooming. I have nine months of, I got so many of these at my house that I get nine months of bloom. They uh, actually, um, I would have had 12 months. I had some blooming in the backyard when that freeze hit in February. Crazy thing about that hard freeze. That was our last frost day that week. You know, that freeze was so late. It was like, you know, it was just unbelievable. But I hope we don't see that for another 30 years. But yeah, these are um, awesome. Whenever they mow a prairie or burn a prairie, these will pop up and have one flower and they'll be three inches tall. And uh, I've seen that happen time and time again. Okay, what do we got next? Scarlet pea. This first year, I've seen these out on a prairie. I've seen them in my prairie here. Um, it's, it's really hard. I never actually got that many seeds. A friend of mine collected these and gave them to me this year. Uh, the scarlet pea, uh, awesome color, not particular about soil, host for gray hair streak, common dog face butterfly. Um, anyways, they're, they're, they, they're, they're like a ground cover, you know, low growing perennial. And, uh, so I finally was able to germinate a bunch of these. I got more to pot up as soon as this plant sells over. So, uh, I got to put some of these around my property. It's good if you got some beds in your yard to put these where you can easily collect seeds. And that's what I'm going to do. Because I, I don't like relying on other people for the uh, seeds for that. Spider lily. Menicalis liriosum. So uh, these grow in the ditches out here. Uh, all over Fort Bend, Brusoria, um, Probably the rural parts of Harris. But they're they're really um, a cool plant. Uh, they get about two feet tall. They're shade tolerant. There's one uh, elm tree on Nash Prairie. If you go out there and you look across that at Great Expanse, you see this one. It, and there's a wetland under that elm tree, and that whole thing is covered with spider lilies. So I planted them in my ditch in the front yard. My wife caught a count, caught a county employee weed whacking them when they were in full bloom. She goes, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm supposed to clean the ditch. And she said, you can't see them blooms. Um, but anyways, I learned about growing these from uh, my friend Tom Solomon. Behind the flower, the white flower, when they're, they'll form these uh, green, they're like, they look like little footballs. And basically, you just push them into the mud. A plant will come up, that football will turn all yellow because of Plants using that for food. They're about an inch long, oblong shape. You push them halfway into a pan of uh, soil. And uh, then they come up, they bloom, they'll disappear in the winter, and then come back up. 
and the, the ones I potted already, the corms were already the size of a golf ball. So uh, they're perennial. I, I showed uh, Susan one time this pocket prairie at Brazos Bend that she worked on. And this was at the base of the hill. And I said, wow, the, I sent her a picture of spirulas. She goes, I put, I planted one there like three years ago. And it sat there all that time until the conditions were right. And it just shot up. So there's a bunch of different varieties, but this is our local one. And uh, they can have a, they're a spring bloomer, but a lot of times in the fall, you'll see them. I saw some blooming recently on the side, on the roadsides. So that, that guy will grow in standing water <coughs> or mud, or, you know, if you want to just have an extra water to it. Uh, Texas coneflower, Rebecca Texana. Uh, I heard that uh, Jaime used to say this was our local coneflower because it's south of I-10, a couple of counties west of here, and then the, about 100 miles into Louisiana. So it's our local coastal coneflower. And in the right conditions, I had a picture out at Nash where it's just all the way at the horizon, it's just yellow, solid coneflowers. Uh, they're easy to grow from seed. Um, them dried seed heads have, I don't pay any attention to the chaff. You know, half of that, when you're breaking one of these up, they're really loose, they come right apart. There's a really sharp, hard cone in the middle of that. And uh, basically, I just lay that whole material down. And uh, now people that do germination tests, with that, which I don't really, I'm not really into, but they have to use some magnification and sit there and separate out a hundred seeds in the groups and then see what percentage of germination you'll get. So that's the only reason you'd ever separate the chaff. Ah, uh, wine cup. I grow this perennial one. Um, they have a corm that looks like a, almost like a carrot in the pot. Now, some of these don't look like much. If you buy them, I don't have that many, but they're in the sale, but that corm, and they're kind of, this would be their dormant time. So you, you can uh, see that corm in the middle of the pot. You plant it, and then the right condition, and the color is just fantastic. So the tendrils start growing out sideways, you know, from March to June. The color is just, it just really adds something to a prairie when you got these. And they're on a local prairies here. They're in my on my property i see them driving around on roadsides too so and uh uh yeah they're great they don't look that great in the pot right now but don't be afraid to buy them because that corm's over a year old so yeah that's just adds a fantastic color eastern grandma grass it says two to three with the seed heads they can go up to five feet it's huge um uh, see that see that grass host plant for skippers who would have thought that they don't it, you can't compare a host plant to a grass like you do a milkweed because they're just going to eat a little part of the leaf and they're going to roll up in the leaf so the problem is people don't want to plant grasses and they really need to i was at susan Kennedy's front yard at sunset a couple of years ago there's butterflies everywhere but when the sun, as the sun was going down, they were going up underneath these grasses and hanging from them to sleep. They don't sleep on a flower head. They're not going to do that. So a good pocket prairie uh, needs to have some grasses. You don't have to have, uh, this thing can be cut back. I actually cut them down to about six inches in the fall. Uh, yeah, and so, um, Great plant, they're huge. I got a bunch of these in the sale. Uh, but yeah, drought tolerant. There's a, the seeds are the bit largest grass seed in North America. There's a university that's working on uh, making a cultivar that makes mass quantities of seed. And you know that a lot of corn, which they got to nuke the heck out of corn to, with nitrogen in the field to get it to grow. But uh, Native Americans ground them this seed in the flour. So they're trying to replace all that corn that's used as a food additive with the uh, 
with the seeds of this, of uh, gamma grass. Gulf muley, uh, this is blooming all over the place right now. I took a ride to uh, Brazos Bend today and uh, Seaborn Creek, both sides of the road. Uh, the overgrown cow pastures out here, a cattle will not touch this plant. And so what happens is uh, these overgrazed cow pastures are full of muley. And uh, I see it on Mima Mounds. It normally doesn't grow on the Mima Mounds, but it's moved there because the cattle ate everything else. And uh, uh, yeah, and I love uh, this Gulf muley. Uh, if you ever see them giant ones, five foot uh, tall, they're using a lot of commercial growing. Those seeds originally came um, from Florida. I think I got the wrong Latin on there. Whoops, let me go back. Yeah, Sylphium gracile. Yeah, that's, yeah, I got the wrong Latin. There's a typo there. Mullenbergia capillaris. But it's, um, it's a, um, a great plant. The ones, like I say, them giant ones that use a lot of bangs, commercial. Freeway plantings, you'll see it. Those are seeds that originally came from Florida. Same, uh, uh, same Latin, but different, different uh, like cultivar. But anyways, uh, I only grow, these grow, the ones I got in the cell, I'm only gonna go to uh, eight, you know, 18 inches to two foot at the max. Now, the love grass, The purple love grass, not a good picture of the inflorescence there. Aerograstus spectabilis, named after the Greek god Eros because of the color. Now the color of that and the muley are exactly the same. Um, when you go out on a prairie and you're looking at all this pink, which is blooming right now, you walk out there, you have to get down and look at the leaves. The leaves on a, on a gulf muley are kind of round. This has a really narrow but flat leaf. And so a lot of times in the field, uh, that's the only way you can tell them apart because they grow in the same conditions. Uh, and uh, Jaime, or, uh, Tom Solomon taught me a trick about, you know, I'll go back one to that. To get the seeds off of that, I'll cut, when that starts to turn a little brown, I'll cut that, I'll fill a whole five gallon bucket with that. And he told me, you sit there, he sits in front of the TV with a box, and you start, you don't try to get all them seeds to fall off. You could put them in a bag for two months and you might get some falling off. But basically we shred that with the scissors. And we keep shredding it, shredding it back and forth till you get this, pull all the stem, the thicker stems out. till you get this uh, fine material, lay that down, and you'll have a great, uh, you'll get 50, lay it, Cover a 50 cell tray with that, you only have 50 uh, muleys. But false indigo bush, uh, I'm not having these in the sale. Mine were too small uh, to bring, but next year I hope to have them more for Fubicosa, six to 12 foot. This is a monster. I'm going to put one out by my pond. Post plant for clouded sulfur greer, haystrick, silver skipper, southern dog face. Um, I'm gonna put one out by my pond and be able to collect seeds out there. Uh, and so it's a great, great plant, but too small to have in our sale. So hopefully next year. Let's see. Oops, I'm going backwards. Summer Mallow, uh, great plant, I collect, uh, this one is actually grows in, doesn't have to be saltwater. It's on the Brazos Bend State Parks uh, plant list. They have uh, white flowers in the, in the, around here. A friend of mine said in a ditch, her uh, by Liberty County, there she sees the white and pink in the same spot. So I go down to, uh, I drive down 288 to Surfside and we run up the coast and we collect these seeds. And that we sing songs because that area is full of rattlesnakes. Um, and so to ward off the rattlesnakes, I guess our, our songs we sing worked because we haven't got bit yet. But people driving by will see us. There was four of us with little pails last year. 
and they're yelling out the window, rattlesnakes, you know, trying to warn us, but we already knew that. These are, our plant cell this year is a little later. You're, these are not gonna bloom, have blooms on them, but I would buy them, put them in the ground. A landscaper uh, last year around Christmas, but 10 of these, I said, you really want them? They were, it was a pot of dirt with about half an inch of green around the old stem from last year, half inch. She said they did great. So uh, the ones I, I got are seeds. If you get a colony of this in a wet spot, it's just phenomenal. And then Kirk's cap, the hummerbirds will actually stay on this for a long, they'll go into one of them flowers for more than 10 seconds. And uh, that's a great plant for shade. So that's the end of the slides. So I wanna thank first Andrea who put together this program. My, <laughs> she's my IT department. And uh, she put together these slides. But you know, I wanna thank Green Star for being involved next door nursery and of course Houston Audubon. So now I'm gonna get a glass of water first but I'll, I'll start taking uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, it's 7.52, we can, yeah, I'll answer questions as long as people are putting them out there. And I also want to mention one thing that um, uh, if you, we need volunteers on that Saturday to separate these plants out and get them in people's cars. Anybody that volunteers, I'm going to, I have these orange tickets, I'm going to give you a, a ticket to a free plant for my nursery. Um, we won't be able to deal with the plants that day. We're gonna have too much on our hands, but everybody's gonna get a ticket. People need to go to Audubon on a Friday before and pick up plants and hang on to them to the Saturday morning. So people have, we got some people lined up to do that, but we'll have to see how much sells it. And, but I can't be involved with it, you know, picking up anybody else's plants, I'm too busy. Um, but anyways, uh, you get an orange ticket from me and then in the, you can come to the market or anywhere else to pick up plants. Hey, hey Mark, a couple people want to know the reference website you mentioned at the beginning that um, shows the host plant and uh, with the corresponding insects. So you, if you go to wildflower.org and uh, you got to can't make a typo. There was a grass that took me five years to ID. I collected it at Herman Bayou, but it had two eyes at the end. It's not going to fix a misspelling for you or close. You have to have the exact spelling. So that's the tricky part. And you can put a common name or a scientific name and then search for plants. And then you go down to the bottom. It's a new feature I found out this year. You hit host. Uh, it'll show host plant for this butterfly. Click on it, it takes you to a NABA a website, and it'll show you the range map of that. Like the six, one of my plants had six, was a host of six butterflies. Uh, four of them occurred in uh, Fort Bend County. So that's the key, and it's really cool. So wildflower.org, that's a lot of my slides. And the information on my slides are all from that website. That's bright. Okay. Um, Donna wants to know if mountain mint grows in sandy soil along the coast. Um, I haven't seen it much south of uh, around here. It's all over Brazos Bend. You see these white clusters sticking up in the prairie. But I don't know about sandy soil. I would add some compost if you're going to plant it because mine are in heavy clay. In rich garden soil, it'll go, it'll act like a mint, like a spearmint, you know, really aggressive. But in clay, they're pretty well behaved. Mm. Okay. The slide says, uh, Plucea or Dorada is a perennial. A lot, hmm. yeah, a lot, a lot of them, it's perennial here. 
a lot of times if you go on that wildflower drought or, or a few plants will say annual slash perennial that's according to what zone you're in mine always come back the ones i've overwintered here they've always came back in the pot yeah so yeah there's some uh some dual plants that are listed that way that have uh um you know that are perennial because we're in a warm zone okay what what growing medium do you use for seed starting i use uh, something with mycorrhizae in it um you know I, I buy wholesale so a lot of the stuff you wouldn't see but you know um just in the seed cells, you know, we got, I got some happy frogs, some, uh, Ray, help me out here. What's the, Fertilone. It's a, yeah, Caldwell Nursery, Fort Bend County has it. Fertilone has no forest products. I did a class at Brazos Bend several years ago, and I took a bag of cheap potting soil and I sifted the wood out of it. And I had a five gallon bucket one third of the way full of wood from one bag of pot soil. And so they just throw that, and that's gonna block up the nitrogen, make your plants yellow. Um, so basically, fertilum's gray. Uh, yeah, anything with, it should say mycoactive or mycorrhizae. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so someone commented that there are more plants on the list that uh, we posted to our website that were that are in this presentation. Are those plants going to be available? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, this if I did every plant on our thing, it would I'd be a two-hour program. So basically, yeah. I highlighted the most popular stuff. You know. Okay. So there's going to be some obscure grasses you don't hear much about from Audubon, um, they're still good. Split grade blue stem is awesome grass, uh, you know, gamma grass, little blue, yeah, so. Elisa wants, you done? Okay, Elisa wants to know what you recommend for shade. She says she loves Turk's cap and American beauty berry. Anything else similar in size? Uh, the elephant's foot, the one we had earlier, that's a great shade plant. And that one will spread around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I got some, uh, they're not in the cell this year. I couldn't get the uh, spot flowers in there. But that's another one. Okay. Do the blooming plants here described as okay in partial shade bloom just as well in the shade? Um, some of them do. Yeah. Milkweed, uh, the uh, perennis milkweed loves shade. That, the Asclepius perennis. It's never like a Nash prairie, 300 and something species, 350 or 60. There's no perennis. But in the ditch, when you're driving down there, in the ditch, on both sides of the road, you see perennis on the way to Nash. It's not on their list because it won't survive the hot sun it's always in the ditch where it's we're not always wet but you know whenever it rains it just fills up floods dries out and they do great there the people from uh south of me here that um some groups go down there in Missouri county and dig before the mowers they dig hundreds of perennials up for the mowers it doesn't have a big taproot like green can't, you can't dig green milkweed and be successful in it, with it, you know, because the taproot's just huge. Kimberly wants you to know that she's bought a lot of Mark's plants for my pollinator, her pollinator habitat gardens in Jersey Village, and she gets uh, so many compliments on how they've grown and all the beneficial, beneficial insects that visit them. They make her so happy. Yeah, thank you, Kimberly. She's my... Uh, Customer of the year, 2021. <laughs> and uh, she brings her own wagon. We got a wagon at the market in case some people, like this other, uh, last week, this guy wanted nine plants, put them in the wagon. Either me or Dre will walk them to their car so they don't have to bring the wagon back. But um, yeah, 
Kimberly's, uh, her pictures are online too, her Instagram, if she wants to give that out, uh, hmm. or Facebook, but uh, beautiful photos. Rena says she has Soledago odora, sweet goldenrod seeds. What are recommendation on when and how to plant them? Sweet goldenrod? Is that the yeah. fragrant? I'm not sure what that one is. Is that the fragrant goldenrod? Odora. Soledago odora. Okay. That implies fragrant. Yeah. I mean, it's hot right now. Uh, things germinate fast with heat. Yeah. Uh, my my guru, Tom Solomon, told me don't plant many seeds after November because, uh, you know, it's too cold. They're not going to germinate. Well, four years ago, I don't know if people remember this. It was 85 degrees on Christmas Day. And that happened two years in a row, just in recent history. And one year, I wasn't laying any seeds down. I thought <laughs> they would have already been up. But germination with heat is great. I did a little blue stem once. I did a whole tray of it. And it was hot, July, really hot. And it went from seeds on a tray to cells and into one gallon in the same month, in 30 days. They were already in gallon pots because they germinated so quick. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, goldenrod's a great plant. There's two behaved ones. I, I had so many seaside this year and I sold out. Uh, and twist leaf, goldenrod, I got a bunch of little seedlings I need to separate uh, when I get a chance. But uh, those two are behaved. There's about 20 goldenrods in Texas. Some of them are going to just take over a lot of the Canadian goldenrods. And, uh, they come up a, all over. They come up all over my yard. Yeah, They're it's easy a myth, to pull out. It's a, it's a myth that they cause allergies too. A lot of people say, yeah. why are you planting that? I had one of them master naturalists said, why are you planting that? You know, it makes me sneeze. And I said, well, the pollen is so heavy, it's not airborne. And yeah. anything with color is there in nature by design to attract pollinators, insects. Uh, ragweed has a small a flower so small you can hardly see it but the pollen is airborne. That's what makes you sneeze. Um, goldenrod corn is heavy pollen like a corn plant. It's not gonna be airborne. You can't get allergies unless it's air, you know, unless it's airborne. So that, that's one myth about goldenrod, but be careful about the varieties because uh, some of them are super aggressive. It is easy to pull up though, in my yeah. experience. Oh yeah. 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 So it was near the top of the list of uh, Ptolemy's uh, best host and wildlife supporting plants after all yeah. the trees. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I had, I had hundreds of seaside this year and I went through all of them. I wish I, you know, I couldn't keep up. So okay. hopefully next year we'll have them. Well, speaking of spreading things, an anonymous um, attendee wants to know um, she's on a budget and is converting large parts of the backyard to native flower beds. She wants to know what's available at the sale that will spread vigorously and fill in large spaces quickly. Uh, the Indian blanket, uh, the Mexican hat, um, to name a few, uh, mountain mint. If it's a, she's got some, sounds like she's got some beds that are kind of raised mountain mint, uh, frog fruit, four inch pots of frog fruit. Got to have ground carbon yep. as a horse plant. Yep. Yep. So that would be off the top of my head, the ones, but yeah. And it can be a good ground cover. Yeah. Even mowed and walked on. Yeah. Yep. We saw that at Mandel Park last month. Mm -hmm. So, Lynn wants to just verify because you say it's a good time to plant plants now. So, will plants yeah. like Indian blanket do okay through the winter? Yes. Um, uh, right now, the ones that you're buying from me are going to have all kinds of seed heads on them. 
and I'm throwing them back in the pots. In fact, some of my other plants are full of Galardia seeds because they just fly around on my nursery tables. I need to find a way to separate those on a one table. But basically, um, yeah, they're, they're a lot of these so you're plants gonna get, have seeds. Okay, and you're going to get free Galardia out of them. Oh, yeah. I throw them. <laughs> I cut them off the brown ones I'm selling at the market. I, I take a scissor, cut the brown stem, cut the little seed head off, and I just drop it in the pot. Okay. And you'll get lots of pups that way. Denise wants to know if you cut back your Gulf muley grass and when, if you do. Yeah, Is it January, a host plant? Yeah, okay. January. Um, uh, you could just take some lopers or something and, and cut them down to about six inches. Immediately when it warms and you get some rain, you'll see the new uh, shoots coming out of the muley really quick. Super and does it attract birds? Uh, probably for nesting material. This Is it a house plant for anything? Um, I'd have to look. You know, have to look we have at wildflower.org. Yeah, we have that kind of information on the store, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just go to wildflower.org, put in uh, Gulf Muley okay. or Mullenbergia capillaris, and then uh, it'll show you the host. Okay. So Kimberly wants everyone to know that she's across from the high school tennis course, and everyone is welcome to see how the native plants grow. In, in Jersey Village. I assume Jersey Village High School. Is there only one? Okay. Uh, Lynn wants to thank you again and looking forward to the sale. Great. We need volunteers, free plant for everybody that shows up. Yeah. Mark will give you a certificate for a free plant later. Yep. Um, Roxanne missed the first part of the presentation. We will share it. It will be on our YouTube channel. Um, maybe later tonight. I'll try. Um, I really can't do things tomorrow. If not, it'll be Saturday morning. Um, Quinn purchased two. Oh, Seaside Goldenrod. Yeah, Solid Hidalgo Semper Verens, Seaside Goldenrod yep. from Mark last yeah. fall. They are now more than eight feet tall and about to explode in blooms. I can't wait to get some more amazing plants from them. That's great. They, the uh, one I planted at um, Urban Harvest next to my booth, these landscapers came in and it just, I couldn't believe it. They cut every bloom and every flower off the plants, just chopped them. But the seaside goldenrod had like six stalks. After they cut it off, it now has like 20 because each one stalk they cut will turn into branches. Mm -hmm. and so, so it's got like, yeah. it's huge. You can come there and see it and it should bloom. Yeah. I, got a, I got one of our, you know, the signs we're selling at the sale, um, the grow natives. I got one mm -hmm. of those signs right in that bed. But, you know, they're not landscapers. They're, the guy told me that, they call them choppers, because that's what they are. They're <laughs> to chop everything. Yeah. And leaf blow. Yeah. That's what they do. Weed eat yeah. and leaf blow. Um, Anne wants to know what you can grow in between so the sidewalk and the street in the city. I assume, is it sunny there? Or shady? I guess we need two answers. I guess you could, at, you could look at yeah. Susie's house and see yeah. what she's done. Yeah. yeah. That's one of the tour stops. Yeah. She but has native plants everywhere, front, back, sides, at the street. Yeah. Yeah, I've got seven acres. I started in 2002 with a little curved bed, put a lot of swamp sunflower in it and some forbs and grasses which is a little c-shaped thing and the neighbors loved it i'm in a deed restricted subdivision 
and I've converted an acre and a half of lawn into tall grass prairie, and it's all blooming right now. And uh, they actually, some of the neighbors came over on golf carts and said, when can we collect seeds? I said, take all you want, you know? So, but a lot of people buy houses out here. This is acreage. You can, you can only zone it down to two acres in this subdivision. Uh, but they'll come in and this one guy had this beautiful wild native yopan and, and full of forbs and just took the tractor to it and planted grass. And I'm like, oh my God. So some of it is so sterile. You know, you see this five acres. We've, we've got to build, like Doug Talmy said, we've got to build pocket prairies from Canada to Mexico in our backyards. And that's our goal. And uh, uh, build it and they will come. My front prairie has a lot of plants that I didn't put in there. Wetland plants, uh, veritas milkweed, uh, ironweed, just things that I actually did, never planted out there. You know, they just all showed up. Yeah. Okay. Della says that she has salt marshmallow under a tree canopy, five feet tall, but it's never bloomed. Will it ever bloom? Um, yeah, they're in full sun. Those are, you know, so I don't know if it'll ever bloom. It should have bloomed up. Uh, that thing will, those things will bloom from May until frost, you know, but mine are like almost done. They're, most of the ones you're going to buy from me, you're going to have seed heads on them. And uh, it's just the timing, you know, last month they were all blooming, but, you know, we put this uh, sale back almost a month because of the hurricane problem. We actually had a hurricane too. So I guess it helped, but, um, you know, uh, that's just the breaks, you know, and, and but these salt marshmallows are perennials and I, I love them. So full sun, okay. white pink. Okay. Glenna comments that follow obedient plant is a big spreader for the person who asked that before. Oh yeah, that's a, that's uh, some people call it fall disobedient plant because it'll yeah. spread so much. The first one I put in at that at the market in that little bed there. Um, I planted on a Saturday, watered it good. Come back the next Saturday, it already had two. They made a pup the first week. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so fall doesn't really, never was on my property, but Dre put it in her butterfly garden. I'm gonna have tons of seeds of that. Pretty much sold out of it, but that's a one. A lot of people like it. You know, they call it fall disappearing plant because it spreads, but if you got an oak tree, and you can't get anything to grow under there, put that in. And it's also, mm. it'll grow in sun or shade. Okay. So that's, that's a great one. Hopefully we'll have that next year. Jackie wants to know if frog fruit will grow in heavy shade under an oak tree. Uh, it may not. It, yeah, yeah, there's some under my trees here, you know, so I would try it. They're a little four inch pots, you know, you can't go wrong. Okay. Um, what, if any kind of mulch would you use around the nine native plants, some shade and some and sun areas? She's doing both. This is from the Hearthstone Garden Club who was one of our grant recipients. Right. Uh, mulch, I try. I would try, you know, you gotta mulch it first, but any mulch that's exposed is gonna, nature's going to fill it in so i would start off with mulch um native like hardwood mulch but then put the frog fruit the scarlet pea um, any other ground covers you can come up with put them in there let them spread and have a green mulch yeah you want to use the tree trimming you know from our native trees like what you get from nature's yeah. way and yeah. since you're way up north maybe yeah, that's a good place to get it. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Lan wants you to know that uh, blue mist flower is a great plant that will spread readily and aggressively. Yeah, it, it is good. And also, um, it benefits from some afternoon 
shade. Like mine, uh, uh, the best place that they grow in my property is on the east side of my house. So they get morning sun up until noon or one o'clock and then they're in the shade. And they've done great in areas like that. But I, I saw them on uh, Mwatney Prairie in Brazoria County and they were in full sun. So, yep. That's a good spreader, one you want to spread. Okay. The start marshmallow do okay in part of the yard that floods during heavy rain, but isn't wet all the time? Yes. Yeah, I got some in my ditch and my ditch is pretty dry right now, but it's blooming right now. Put some behind my mailbox in the ditch, the street, it's where the county can't really get their mower in there. They want to, but the mailbox protects them. <laughs> Okay, Natalie wants to know our, our YouTube channel and it is Native Plants H-O-U. And there is a link in today's Eventbrite um, newsletter and there are links on our website. So you can check there. Yeah, also go to, to mine that was three years ago when I, um, I did a, a presentation with no slides, 100% videos in the field uh, in my property. Oh, last year. Was that last year? I think it was. A that year. was last year. Oh, really? Okay, mm -hmm. so that's on the YouTube channel. That was fun because I had a 18 year old intern who's studying horticulture uh, in, um, in college right now. And uh, Emily Russell, she uh, had a boyfriend that taught her how to edit film. And she got that done two days before she had to go back to school. And uh, mm -hmm. It's just a, that was fun because there was no slides, all videos, and all right there standing with the plant, you know. And uh, we had butterflies coming into the picture while we were filming, which was awesome. So, so that's a great thing to watch. I really enjoyed that one. Yeah. So during uh, Talamy's talk, quite a few people wanted to know about clay soil, and we have had at our monthly meetings talks about uh, dealing with our soil. So you can find uh, recordings of those on our YouTube channel. And then also last year, we had one very specifically about our compacted clay soil. But that was one of our first ever Zoom meetings. And I think we streamed it to Facebook. You'll find it on Facebook. And yeah, we need to download it from there and get it on our YouTube channel. Although it might be there. But yeah, so just last spring, we did that. And then um, spring 2020. And um, in prior years, we've had other people talk about our soil. Yeah, and actually, that clay soil was the soil of the prairies. That's what it grew on. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's a little, the, the, the pimple mounds on the prairies are more sandy, so you get different species on the top and on the edges of them. Like rosin yeah. wheat grows around the edge. Uh, big blue and little blue are on top of the mounds. Um, Muley's off to the side. So, yeah. Basically, that's the sandier part. But this heavy clay soil, that's what, you know, and uh, down in Armand Bayou, they passed up, this is four years ago, they passed up over 300,000 one gallon pots in the ground, converted 400 acres that was a tallow thicket in the prairie. And the way they do it, um, I got these little planting guides I actually hand out at the market, but they pour a half a gallon of water in the hole put all the soil back, even though you're displacing that pot's worth. And then you pour another half gallon and they walk around in a circle till you hear it get all the air out of the hole. And basically they've done that 300,000 times and then they never go back and water. And they, over 80% live. So they're only watered yeah. once and it doesn't matter. Um, but they plant, uh, they got a planting group that plants your, uh, 52 weeks a uh, year. They have plant, uh, they have this uh, prairie pandemonium where on a, if the soil's wet, they'll put 5,000 plants in. If the soil's dry, they'll put 2,500 in. And they get school groups and scouts. COVID's kind of slowed that down, but that's what they do. And uh, yeah. we converted 400 acres. It's gorgeous out there too. Well, a lot of our homeowners though, they've got the builders come in and um pack down the builder soil. Um, so they really compact it. 
And just the short answer to the solution with compacted clay soil is compost. You don't have to work it in, you top dress it and it, it works out. Yep. Um, and I guess it's clarifying that her space between her sidewalk and street is sunny and she will go see Susie's house. Oh yeah, go there. Yeah. 80% uh, uh, of them plants came from my nursery too, so. Yep. Um, Kat thinks, thought that seaside goldenrod was shorter than regular goldenrod. Is this incorrect? Or is height based on um, the amount of sun and water? Sun and water. I've seen them uh, three, four feet. Uh, I've seen them six and eight feet. Mine out in front, I got some bloom, just starting to bloom right now. And they're about four foot, four and a half foot tall. And, um, but yeah, in the pot, they can get really big. Even in a pot last year, I was afraid that, that the the last, not last year, the last in person, I had about a dozen of those and they were huge. <laughs> you can't believe this huge plants growing in that one gallon pot. And gallons aren't really a gallon like compared to a gallon of milk. They're called trade gallons. They're a four fifths of a gallon. So, yeah, okay. I was afraid they'd fall over at the show, but. Yeah, every one of them sold too. Okay. Susie wants everyone to know that all of her prairie plants came from Mark. He is the best and most re reliable grower of prairie <laughs> plants in our area. Thanks and you. we love you, Susie. And her, her aquatic plants came from Green Star uh, Wetlands Plant Farm. Yeah. So, and you'll see them go to our house on Sunday. There's an address in your um, email today. Yeah, this is a ways off, but me and Mary Carol Edwards have the dining hall at Brazos Bend State Park uh, reserved for the last uh, Sunday in March. So it's kind of early. We'll put out a flyer in January, but we're both for plants. Sell. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do a program at the park, and then we can't sell them in the park, but they can come to my house. You know, we're gonna normal tours. We got three tours that, with that program. We go to a pocket prairie and a butterfly garden that Andrea maintains at the nature center and uh, then we go uh, uh, to my house and then to Nash Prairie like boom 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 so it's a fun day usually have a I had 60 people out at Nash uh, last year 60 out of 100 made it all the way so that was great Okay, Cat Elder wants y'all to know that Mark's plants can also be viewed in the Westbury Community Gardens apiary pollinator bed along the fence line, the north fence line, 12581 Dunlap. And I think you can find Westbury Community Garden with a search. Um, and they're also in the pocket prairie and the butterfly beds. Okay. Lan wants you to know that all branches of salt marshmallow will turn brown in winter and you can cut them off if you want. And then when weather warms up in late spring, new shoots will come up from the roots and yeah, the I, seeds. Yeah, I had, shoots, drop. Uh, I had shoots around the stem of the, my salt marshmallow. Like I say, the landscaper bought them. I was kind of a little leery, half inch of growth around the stem. And it was, a, and this was around Christmas. You know, of course, it wasn't last Christmas. It was or last. You know, we had an early, early freeze last year too. People don't remember December eighth. Yeah, Cynthia wants to know if you'll be at Urban Harvest this Saturday. Yes, I will. Andrea is going to be at Surfside. They have a, a pollinator festival down at Surfside. She's going to be down there with the booth and. Um, they, they, I also sold a lot of plants to the city of Surfside. They built this nature uh, trails along the, right along the intercoastal waterway and the birds. They wanted to kind of mimic what Quintana was doing. If people are familiar with the watching, bird watching at Quintana, well, they got them. And I yeah. saw stuff, they were IDing the birds for me, a lot of Orioles and different things. I had no idea what they were, but. Yeah, so that's uh, Saturday also. Okay. Um, 
Mark wants to know what's the best time to broadcast Mexican hat seed, fall or spring? Um, spring or fall. I'm sorry. October is oh. the best. October is the best month to throw seed out. I don't plant basket flower. I get them at seed swaps and I throw them out in my prairie. So right now, yeah, get a bunch of them seeds, start tossing them. But October is the best month. Uh, if you wait till spring, you know, it's going to, you know, but the, the overwinter breaks down the hard seed coats and they'll germinate. Okay. I'm just checking. We're all out of questions. I see lots and lots of thank yous in the chat. Okay. Um, and in the, in the Q&A. Lan has shared a link, oh, a tiny URL link to our webpage again, the Wildscapes page in specific. Um, oh, and she's put in details about times. That's all new. That's yeah, good. So check it all the time. We'll add information as we can. Help us volunteer. We need yeah. your help. Yep. Yeah. We also need board and committee members. Um, Uh, Susie says she'll share some seeds at her garden on Sunday as well. Oh, great. Also, I want to let you know, it was also in the, in the email today that the state, um, Native Plant Society of Texas state decided to create uh, membership recognition pins for people who've been members for a long time. And um, there are pins for every five years you've been a member, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. If you've been a member 25 years, you get five pins. They're very pretty magnetic pins with images of um, native plants. And um, I will have them at, or at least that's my plan to have them at Susie's house. I'm going to help her if anyone else wants to come help. Yep. Um, that would be great. Um, just to greet people while she's showing people around. Um, but yeah, the plan is that, that for them to be available for those who haven't gotten theirs yet, and most people haven't. Um, you can go get them at Susie's house. Yeah, and also I saw that list the state put out of the month. It was for an award thing. It was like the the year you joined, and mm -hmm. uh, I I don't know if that's still up because I'd like to see what year I joined because I didn't write it down when I saw that list. Well, we can see which group you're in and how many pins you get. Yeah, I want to see that. Okay. All right. And I just posted the plant sale link in the chat. Uh, you won't be able to purchase anything yet uh, until Saturday morning. Uh, okay, everybody copy and paste that and keep it. Although we will get it on the website. Yeah, yeah. we'll email it and out, what, we'll put it on the website. What time is the store opening? Uh, I don't think we've come to a consensus. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were talking about just like 1201, but then things could be happening while we're asleep that we can't deal with. So I, I think probably 8 a.m. so that we, you know, people don't have to stay up late. Yeah. So you don't have to be up early or at dawn to try and beat everyone else. Yeah. We'll email okay. out the exact time through event. Break. Okay. We'll continue arguing that. Okay, <laughs> the pros and cons. So, did everybody copy and paste it? And uh, note that the I, I'm still adding plants to the site. So keep checking back tomorrow uh, as more plants appear. Okay, I'm trying to see I how. See it, so I'm gonna send it out again. Terry Hurley says she can't find her email from today. But I'm... Can you resend the info about the tours? Terry, can you private message me or to the panel your email address? Over in the chat. 
Okay, I got it. All right, I'll forward you. It might actually be the draft that I sent earlier because I don't get a copy of the email and that's the quickest thing I can send you. Okay, I guess, are we done? I think we are done. Hey. The sessions are good night. Good night. Thank and you, good Mark. Night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody, you. for uh, participating. Come get your free plant. Don't forget. Volunteer. We need it. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm having trouble switching to an email so I can. Why do I not? I just get a. OK, I got it. Good job, Andrew. Thank you. And Linda. Thank you, Linda, for stepping Thank in. Thank you. <laughs> we're, we're done with that for another year. No, I got I to gotta go watch <laughs> the ninth, ninth inning of the Astros game that they just won in the playoffs. So it, uh, I shut the TV off at the ninth inning. I know they won, though. So I'm oh. going to go watch that. All right. Well, have fun. All right. Take care. Good night, everyone. Good night. No, I forgot her name, so I can't say hi. Hello. All right. I oh, land. We can hear that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do we just shall we make it midnight? I don't care. Okay. I'm gonna. Good night, everyone. Thank you again for coming.